Our housing was barely habitable. We lived in damp, mold, horrible conditions. The kitchen was unsafe to use. We constantly reported repairs that were being done, and sometimes they got done, but mostly they didn't. It made you feel worthless. That you didn't deserve to have a nice, not even a nice, a practical kitchen and a practical bathroom. That was a woman from Scotland speaking about her housing conditions before she and other people in her community got involved with a project to use human rights to improve them. She goes on to describe how using human rights made a difference to her life. This human rights based approach to housing was critical for our community. It was vital that we got our voices heard. We learned skills we didn't really know we had, and it should be used by every community across the whole of Scotland. Now our houses are safe, secure, comfortable, warm, practical. But what are human rights, and why do they matter? In the story I just said, human rights are things that, when met, ensure our basic human dignity is assured, and we can live life on our own terms. They are inherently part of all of us, and um, something we have by virtue of being human, the expression of some fundamental human values, values like equality, dignity, fairness, respect. And when you ask people what human rights mean to them, these are the words they tend to come up with when, when they're asked to explain them. But also, since 1948, there are global legal framework articulated and written down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Subsequently, they've been further defined in international law through a system of legally binding treaties, monitoring processes, and through the establishment of a network of national human rights institutions, like the one I chair, the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Seventy years ago, the political will to forge the Universal Declaration of Human Rights rose out of the atrocities of the Second World War, when the deaths of an estimated 62 million people at the hands of their respective governments led to the widespread recognition that states can exceed their authority and wield their power to the detriment of their citizens, and that international safeguards and protections need to be built in to stop that ever happening again. And in case you think these are historical aberrations and these rights are not needed today, think only of what's happening in Syria or Yemen, or closer to home, where the impacts of austerity mean people living on benefits are sanctioned by our welfare system to the extent that the rising use of food banks is seen as a developing social norm, where the rise of far-right views and building xenophobia go unchallenged in public debates and the misogynistic use of, forces of social media forces women off the internet. So, human rights are about giving citizens the ability to hold states to account for the use and abuse of their power. But they're also essentially about creating a structured but dynamic space where the balance of power in different relationships can be equalised. Eleanor Roosevelt described them as being about small places, close to home. And she went on to say, if rights are not realised there, then we, we will search in vain um, for progress in the wider world. In Maine, at the moment, decisions affecting our rights are made, sometimes with us taking part, most often not, by governments and parliaments in all their settings, council offices, schools, colleges, other workplaces, doctor surgeries, on hospital wards, on the street, on the web, myriad locations. And often we will not know that it is our rights that are affected and our rights that are at stake. Sometimes I describe them as being about the conversations that take place behind closed doors, where essential decisions are made about the future of our lives and the lives of our family members and friends. When I worked in mental health, I would often hear stories of decisions being made about people's medication, about their care, about when and if they could go home, all without the people actually affected being part of the discussion. All decisions which impact on our rights. And these conversations, so important to our lives potentially, are seldom seen as being about human rights, 
but we are. And our ignorance of our rights amongst ourselves and the people responsible for realising them is one of the core reasons they're not better realised today. The rights that are described in the Universal Declaration cover all aspects of our lives, from the right to work and earn a decent income so that we can live in dignity, the right to vote and participate in our communities and our democracies, the right to a fair trial, so that when things do go wrong, we can be confident in being treated justly, the absolute right to life, and live free from torture or inhuman and degrading treatment, the right to live in adequate housing. So human rights are both a reflection of societal norms, a mirror to our values, and a way of challenging norms and evolving new ones, a roadmap towards a better society where we all live with dignity in reality. The treaties and conventions of the human rights framework balance the universality of the site and of the rights they seek to protect, while allowing for significant latitude for individual states about how they want to do that. In other words, we all have all the rights, but we don't have them in isolation. We have them in very different contexts and settings. So the rights framework seeks to enable cultural and societal norms to be reflected in how human rights are protected locally. Sometimes that might mean they're not challenging enough when people's rights are systematically being abused. And in fact, the strength of the accountability they bring to bear on states is often the subject of criticism in that the framework provides little sanction on states when things go wrong. But rights also have the power to give people power in a way that other approaches to social change don't. When social issues or specific issues that affect groups who are marginalised or underrepresented, unheard, silenced, oppressed, invisible or vulnerable, when they're framed as rights issues and when advocacy and campaigning takes place within that frame, the effects can be transformative. Disabled people have used rights to challenge societal norms that have too often treated them as passive recipients of care and paternalistic support. Although the reality of disabled people's lived experience in the UK is still, is still far from equal to non-disabled people, the clear and assertive articulation of, for example, the right to independent living from the UN Convention on the rights of people with disabilities both sets the standard for where we need to be as a society and gives us a benchmark to measure how far we are still falling short. But back to Scotland. Here, a group of residents have been, holding, uh, have been using human rights to hold their landlord, a public authority, to account for poor housing conditions. The idea that these conditions were not just a bad thing that had to be put up with but that were in fact a potential breach of international law was transformative for the community, giving them an internationally agreed standard to mobilise around and to take to the landlord to say this needs to change. Since then, £2.4 million pound investment has been made in the properties, bringing about a transformation in the residents' living conditions. And from the residents' perspective, we've not seen as many ambulances the people are using their kitchens more. They're enjoying having family around. In fact, the biggest impact on me personally, said one of the residents, was when one of my neighbours said to me, for the first time ever, she was going to have a Christmas party, because this time she wasn't ashamed. Poor housing kills communities, but now it's starting to grow again. So this process that the residents were engaged in wasn't always easy. Everybody involved was challenged in one way or another as the process of realising a group of residents' rights took its course. So the other thing that happened as a result of that work is an understanding that Mary Robinson, the former President of the Republic of Ireland and UN Ambassador, UN Human Rights Ambassador, recognised that discomfort is where change happens. Discomfort when people claim their rights. As one of our other partners in our work observed, 
people claiming their rights from power is going to be uncomfortable for power. And people on the ground have to be brave to do that. But that space of discomfort is actually necessary for the alchemy of change to happen. Sometimes we see a shying away from that, dis that kind of discomfort, as often those in power are not used to, be held, to being held accountable for the use of the power they have. And those who have the rights are not used to holding that space and ensuring that their rights are realised. But we also know that the key to making change is people engaging in the process. One thing that human rights demands for them to have impact is for people to talk all aspects of the issue through from a human rights perspective. If rights are not being realised, why not? What is in the way? How can barriers be reduced and removed? Who decides? And how can they be engaged and brought on board to understand and reflect on what could make a difference? Indeed, that discussion and dialogue in and of itself is a form of accountability. And the strength and importance of making rights explicit in all of these conversations is, then, is that then everyone knows what their rights are and who is responsible for delivering on the rights. They become common ground rules that we can all sign up to and recognise what steps have to be taken for progress to be made. So, the big thing that makes human rights interesting from a disruptive point of view is the core principle of the whole framework, that of being accountable for your actions. The main focus being really on states being accountable for their actions in terms of actually delivering on people's rights. And it's the law that helps make that happen. Having our rights enshrined in law gives us all essential legal safeguards. And yet, around the world, the rights that have the least legal protections most often are the rights that people care most about in their day-to-day -day lives. Economic, social and cultural rights, like the right to housing, right to food, health and social security. This is true in the UK as well. In fact, it is a failure to deliver against those rights for our populations that has led to rising inequality. We can change this though. There is a wealth of international experience and practice in courtrooms and parliaments for us all to learn, replicate and build on when it comes to protecting our economic, social and cultural rights. Taking action to better protect people's rights by incorporating these international standards into domestic law here in the UK as well as elsewhere is all the more important here given the context of Brexit and the risks to rights this represents. In Scotland, the First Minister has committed to launching a task force to make this happen, and I look forward to that. So, we have a road well travelled and a future path to walk. The realisation of human rights is on a journey, and we're walking all forward all the time. But I'm going to leave our last word to our local residents. What I have learned is massive, and it's not just about housing. If you have an adequate house, it reduces your fuel poverty, which reduces your poverty, which means you're not starving or cold, which impacts on health in a positive way. What we've seen here is that people are starting to feel better because their housing has improved. At that human level, it's transformative. <laughs>